Uh, last time we were working through the major theological affirmations of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, which will color the rest of the Deuteronomistic history. And we'll see, uh, beginning next week, how all that works out in the Deuteronomistic history, beginning with Joshua and working our way through Judges, and then finally into the rise of the monarchy, Samuel and Kings. So last time we stressed the importance that Deuteronomy assigns to uh, covenant and the way they think about that. Uh, the notable features are the way in which covenant has to be renewed in each generation, uh, the opportunity to either accept or reject the demands of the covenant is offered to each new generation, which is good news. The bad news is that if you do not uphold your half of the covenant, then the deity is going to punish you for that. That's the way that covenants work. So it's a very clear kind of binary system in Deuteronomy. You either obey or you don't. And if you obey, you're going to do well in the land that God is taking you to. If you do not uh, obey, then you are going to be punished, and that punishment may well take the form of expulsion from the land. So the importance of the land in that covenant idea is clear. Uh, if you want to remain in the land that God promised to the ancestors, then you do have to be obedient to the demands of the covenant. What is not stated so clearly in Deuteronomy is what happens after punishment. Does God then offer a new chance? Well, that would seem to be what Deuteronomy is implying. But later on in the history, that will change some, and they will begin to raise the possibility that God will simply walk away from Israel, that there will come a time when after a certain number of rejections, and nobody but God knows what that number is, after so many rejections, God will just say, well, that's it. I'm through with this, and we're going to try it with another group of some sort. So that possibility is always open, and it becomes most explicit in uh, Jeremiah 7, where in no uncertain terms, Jeremiah, in his so-called temple sermon, uh, lays out uh, a version of the Deuteronomic theology, which has God saying quite clearly in the oracle that Jeremiah delivers to the people at the temple, uh, if you do this, and this then turns out to be a short version of the Ten Commandments, then I will let you live in this place. Uh, but if you don't, then remember what happened to Shiloh, where I used to make my name dwell. And I, of course, they know what happened to Shiloh. Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines as punishment for the evils that took place in the cultic performance there. And the ark itself, and thereby the presence of God, was, was removed from Shiloh. So it keeps open the possibility you know, later on as Deuteronomism develops, at least in some circles, the idea that God could in fact leave and go somewhere else. And we'll come to that uh, momentarily when we talk about the way in which Deuteronomy talks about divine presence and the notion of one place of worship, one sanctuary for the deity and how Deuteronomy thinks of the deity dwelling in that one place. <clears throat> so we'll come to that. But that's all tied in uh, with this notion of covenant. We also talked about the idea of, uh, which really is the fundamental theological idea of Deuteronomy, and that is the notion of the one God. And that is, uh, comes up immediately after the Ten Commandments, at the beginning of Deuteronomy, as if what follows is a kind of interpretation or exegesis of the first commandment of the 10. That is, there is only one God for Israel. 
And uh, it is, uh, the exegesis of that is the uh, opening Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. Yahweh is your God, Yahweh alone. So it's the notion that there is only one God for Israel. Uh, there are other deities out there, the writer knows, but they are not your business. You've got enough on your plate to take care of the one deity. Uh, don't worry about what happens with any of the rest of them. And uh, over against that is an explicit prohibition of the worship of other deities. You are not to bow down to them or serve them. This, of course, is a quote from uh, the Ten Commandments. So both those things are clear in Deuteronomy. And this is helping to define a kind of monotheism, which we usually say is the restriction of worship to the one God. And in this case, it is not a pure theoretical monotheism of the sort that we will later encounter in the uh, exilic portion of Isaiah, where there is a theoretical monotheism. For those folks living in the exile, uh, there were no other real deities in the cosmos. There was only one deity. Uh, you saw this already in the uh, priestly narrative in Exodus, uh, when uh, Moses and Aaron were negotiating with Pharaoh, from the standpoint of the priestly writer in Exodus, there is only one deity in that story. The Pharaoh, who is claimed to be a deity, the living god Horus, is in fact not a god at all. And the whole story of the Exodus, as the priestly writer tells it, is, is designed to point that out to you over and over again. So in that sense, they're uh, somewhat on the same page, but the monotheism of the priestly writer is probably much more extreme in some ways than the monotheism of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy still makes room for the possibility that there might be other deities around. Uh, so, uh, but but that, that core assertion that there is only one God for Israel and there is only one uh, deity to be worshipped by Israel uh, is the mark of Deuteronomism. Anytime you see that in the history, uh, you know that it's uh, playing with a core theological element of Deuteronomism, and it is what marks that uh, belief and separates it from other beliefs that are out there uh, to be had. So uh, this is under the heading of one God as a uh, mark of Deuteronomic theology. Just as there is one God, there is only one people of Israel. And there is an emphasis in Deuteronomy on the notion that all Israelites are somehow members of this one people. And we will see the way in which this oozes over into politics uh, as the monarchy itself forms. And the idea that the most complete form of uh, monotheism is going to involve the one people of God who are um, all together in one place. And that's going to be uh, a marker of the conquest narratives. And we see what happens when all the people act together as a single unit in the uh, conquest of the land that is given to them. So uh, the notion of one people seems to be very clear. Now, uh, you're already beginning to sense that there is a kind of aspect of unreality about the Deuteronomist. If you doubt that, we're, gonna, we're going to see a little later on some other examples of it. Um, what we know about the formation of early Israel is that Israel is, in fact, put together from disparate pieces. Uh, there are different tribes to start with. They don't always get along with each other. Uh, and we'll see that play out in the history in Joshua and Judges. Uh, but from the standpoint of the Deuteronomist, there is a notion of the unity of the people and the special status of the people. This doctrine of election of Israel is very strong in Deuteronomistic theology. And uh, I read you a portion of that uh, uh, 
exhortation in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, which illustrated that point. I want to read it again for you as an indication of how they do this, and I want to put it in its larger context. So we'll start with 7, verse 1. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the famous seven nations in the land, which are an interesting list uh, of people that uh, really uh, occupied the land at different times, and uh, some of them probably not in existence at the time this text is being written. <coughs> but they're always enumerated, and there are always seven of them, so-called seven nations. Clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, and you must utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them so you are not to make any kind of uh, peace treaty with these inhabitants, these traditional inhabitants of the land. Uh, <clears throat> make no covenant with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Notice that this isolationism that seems to go along with the way Deuteronomy thinks about this uh, has religious roots to it. Uh, you can't associate with them at all because it will damage your fidelity to Yahweh, which is the primary theological aim that uh, ties Israel together. So you get a very uh, Israel alone theology here uh, being articulated by the Deuteronomist. Now this, this is never going to be implemented you know this from the beginning, just from the way it, it operates. And the uh, story of Israel's history in the land will give you example after example of how the Israelites never followed this. But it is the Deuteronomic ideal, and like so much else in Deuteronomism, we have no idea how it would have worked out if it were actually uh, practiced. But it is very clear that if you do go and worship other gods, and we already know this from looking at what they think about monotheism, then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But this is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles, and burn their idols with fire. Notice that the... This does not speak to the issue of what you do to the people. You are to destroy their worship objects. And by destroying their worship objects, you, in a sense, destroy the people themselves. Uh, so this is Deuteronomy's idea of how you address the risk of worshiping other gods. You simply destroy the uh, paraphernalia that goes along with the worship of other gods. Archaeologically, we know, of course, that there are pillars and altars and so on all over the country. Just who they belong to uh, is impossible to tell from the archaeological record, but it's a heavy lift to get rid of all of these things uh, later on. And then these words, which talk again about the unity of Israel. You are a people holy to the Lord your God, that is set apart, that's what holy means to be set apart from the normal and to become part of the sacred. So you are holy to Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God has chosen you out of all the people on the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you, in fact, were the fewest of all people. It was because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slaves, from the house of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that Yahweh your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty 
with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and who repays in their own persons those who reject him. He does not delay but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. So Deuteronomy here is pretty much outlining how life in the land has got to go. If you want to uh, succeed, you have to be obedient. Again, this kind of binary system, you either do it or you don't. There's no sort of halfway, there's no uh, uh, modification of things, there's no extenuating circumstances. It's all done uh, either uh, positively or negatively. And in return, the people uh, either get along with Yahweh, Yahweh is faithful to them for thousands of years, or not, depending on what their own reaction is. So uh, it is a very simplistic system that Deuteronomy has in mind. So uh, one de deity, one people, and the third component of that begins now the law uh, that is at the core, the genuine polity of the people, and that is the notion of one sanctuary. Um, the worship of the one God is to take place for Deuteronomy only in a single sanctuary. This is a major innovation on the part of Deuteronomy. Uh, if you look at the narratives that we have looked at so far, uh, say in the Yahwist or the very little Yellowist material that we have in the Pentateuch, you remember that worship took place generally wherever people were. Um, when Abraham goes to one place or another, he builds an altar for the worship of Yahweh. And uh, this continues. People continue to worship at different places. Deuteronomy has in mind worship in a single place. Now, it will be clear later on that that one place is Jerusalem. That's not the way the law here is formulated because they have not yet come into the land and Jerusalem is not yet Israelite territory. There will be, of course, a dramatic story later on in the David cycle of stories about how David himself captured Jerusalem even though, and his tribe, the tribe of Judah, is thought to be in some circles the tribe to which Jerusalem was given. There is some disagreement about that if you read carefully the lists that deal with the allotment of land in Joshua, you'll see that they were not always clear just where Jerusalem fit on this chessboard. But the narrative is absolutely clear that Jerusalem was one of the uncaptured areas in the uh, conquest and was the property of the Jebusites who were thought only to be the residents of, pre-Israelite residents of Jerusalem. We don't know that there were Jebusites elsewhere, uh, but they certainly were in Jerusalem until David takes it away from them and makes it his own personal city. And we'll talk about the, uh, both the theology and the politics of that move by doing it that way. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> command to worship in a single place is first of all clearly an innovation and second explained using a characteristic deuteronomistic uh, image. It is coupled with the demand to desacralize all other places of worship in the land that uh, is now being given to Israel. This does not amount to the destruction necessarily of other practices or worship spaces so much as it demands the desacralization of them. That is, it's all right to have altars except the altars, altars have to be desecrated in such a way that they are no longer usable as altars. The easiest way to do that is to smash them in pieces. Uh, there are other ways. You can bury them, for example. Uh, you can ritually deface them. You can cut the horns off a horned altar. I mean, there are many different ways that you could do this. 
but it has to be done. There's going to be only one sacred space, and that is going to be for the worship of Yahweh. So this command begins in a somewhat complex set of commands in chapter 12, but the, I won't go through where the difficulties are in the chapter. If you want to sort of read through it and try to make coherent logical sense out of it, you're welcome to, to do that. Uh, but the, the bottom line of all of this is clear enough. These are the statutes and the ordinances that you must diligently observe in the land that the Lord, your God of your ancestors, has given you to occupy all the days that you live on the earth. So this is the entry into the polity section. This is what life in the land under Deuteronomic rule or thought is supposed to look like. And it begins typically with a law of the altar, the place where the deity is to be worshiped. You must demolish completely all the places where the nations whom you are about to dispossess served their gods on the mountain heights, on the hills, under every leafy tree. These are all uh, Deuteronomic cliches about foreign worship, how worship of other gods takes place and where. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, burn their sacred poles with fire, hew down the idols of their gods, and thus blot out their name from their places. So if you don't provide uh, structures to worship other deities, then the other deities will go away and cease to exist because there is no place to worship them. There's the notion that sacrality has to do with places where the gods live, and if you don't have a home for the gods, then these foreign deities will simply disappear from the scene. You shall not worship the Lord your God in such ways. So you may not repurpose, for example, a foreign altar for the worship of Yahweh, uh, nor could you take a temple that was dedicated to the worship of another god and redo it as a Yahweh temple. <clears throat> you can't just do that by changing the nameplate on the altar or the temple. Um, so it doesn't work that way. And in fact, you are not really at liberty, according to Deuteronomy, to choose at all the place where God will be worshiped. That is a divine choice. God will choose the place where the deity will be worshiped. Now here, Deuteronomy is picking up on a very old ancient Near Eastern practice. If you look in Mesopotamian texts at uh, texts that deal with temple dedication or temple building, you will see that the temples are always said to be constructed, at least in plan, by the deities who inhabit them. So uh, the kings brag that the deity founded the uh, central worship place of a particular city, and even though it has now fallen into disrepair, when the king rehabbed the place, uh, he was very careful to look for the original foundations because the original foundations were thought to be established personally by that deity. And so he was very careful to look for the original foundation to make sure that the rebuilt temple would be in exactly the place that the god wants the temple to be replaced. If you don't do it this way, then the god may reject the temple and not want to live there. And then you're in trouble. So uh, this notion of the deity choosing the temple site or the place is a, an ancient Near Eastern practice which here is being uh, carried over bodily into Deuteronomic thinking. You shall seek the place, this is verse 5, that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes as his habitation to put his name there. This is the way, the idiom that is used for the deity dwelling in a place. Notice that it does not talk about the deity dwelling there in a bodily or physical form. Rather, the name of the deity is 
uh, placed there by the deity. And so the single sanctuary is labeled simply the place where the deity puts the divine name. And the divine name is made to dwell there. So you've got a notion of the presence of the deity here, which is only partially what later theologians will call a doctrine of real presence. That is to say, yes, the deity is there, but in fact, only the name of the deity is there, which raises the possibility that the deity, or in part, may be elsewhere at the same time. That is, the deity is not exhausted by the placing of the name there. This is characteristic of Deuteronomism, and it is clear that all of this is the choice of the deity. And this is what, of course, Jeremiah is pointing out when he says, remember my shrine at Shiloh, where I used to make my name dwell, but the name has now moved. It moved with the ark. And first of all, took up residence with the Philistines. They couldn't handle it. It came back. It lived in the house of a Levite for a while. And then David finally moved the ark along with the divine presence to Jerusalem. So. Uh, this notion of the mobility of the system uh, characterizes Deuteronomy. The deity is capable of making at least the divine name dwell in a place, but that may be temporary. The deity can just as well choose some other place. Now this, is, this will be, and we'll look at the passage later on in 2 Samuel 7. This is in major contrast to the theology that eventually grows up with the monarchy in Jerusalem where uh, the kings in Jerusalem believed that the real presence of God was indeed in Jerusalem. And this is the difference between the two major theological ways of thinking about it. The Jerusalem theology talked about the, the aura of the deity, uh, what is called the kavod in Hebrew, the, the force field, if you like, that surrounds the deity and actually is visible. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that when, when that uh, force field enters the temple after Solomon builds it, it is visible from a distance, according to the description. You can tell that God is resident there because the, the aura is visible. And uh, in Jerusalem, they be, uh, believed that that was a physical thing, that God really did live in that temple. And therefore, it was necessary to keep the house neat and clean and free of impurity for the deity. And it is that that causes this elaborate system that the priestly writers have of making sure that sin is eradicated, not from the earth generally or from people. That's easy enough to do. Uh, but that the sanctuary of the deity has to be kept free of sin. Otherwise, the deity will decide the place is too messy and leave. And if the deity leaves, then you're in trouble because the protective qu uh, quality of the deity's presence is going to go elsewhere. And indeed, when we look at Ezekiel uh, during the, after the first deportation, he has a very graphic picture of the deity, the aura of the deity, leaving the Jerusalem temple and leaving it, the whole city, therefore, to the mercy of the Babylonians. But the city cannot be captured as long as the deity is there. So uh, these two theologies of how the deity dwells are very different in the way that they pr work out in practice. So this is the... Uh, way in which Deuteronomy wants worship to take place. It's going to happen only at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And so uh, they really do believe in a single sanctuary. That's going to create lots of other problems for them. And some of them are going to be addressed in the laws that follow. Uh, and we'll take a quick look of those as we go by. So what is the structure of the great society as Deuteronomy thinks of it? Uh, the laws after chapter uh, 12 begin to deal with that. Uh, first of all, there are ways of making sure 
that uh, only the worship of the one God, Yahweh, takes place in the land. Uh, so chapter 13 is actually a whole chapter about the enemy within. Uh, that is, people in the land who might undermine the worship of the one God. It's significant that this occurs in the land. They're not, they assume, as a matter of course, that deities in other nations will worship other gods. That's none of your business. What is dangerous is if the worship of those gods begins to spring up in Israel itself and violate the one God principle for Israel. And so uh, chapter 13 could be called high trees, the laws of high treason against the Deuteronomic state. Uh, what can you, how can you do the most injury to the, uh, to the uh, Deuteronomic state? And the obvious answer from what you already know is if you allow the worship of other gods to spring up. And that has to be eradicated at all costs, according to the Deuteronomist. So, uh, chapter 13 begins, If prophets or those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you uh, omens or portents, thereby assuring the accuracy of their words, and the omens or the portents declared by them take place, and if they then say, these are people in your midst, for heaven's sakes, Let's go worship other gods whom we have not known and let us serve them. This, this is going to have a kind of humorous character to it as it goes, uh, given it's a serious subject matter. That's something of a surprise. So let's go worship some other gods. We haven't done that in a while. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you must not listen to the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams, for the Lord is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, the Lord your God uh, you shall follow, him alone you shall fear, his commandments you shall keep, his voice you shall obey, in case you haven't gotten that before, uh, earlier in Deuteronomy, here it is again, uh, and to him you shall hold fast, but those prophets who divine by dreams shall be put to death for having spoken treason, against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slaves, to turn you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge evil from your midst. So even if it is an internal uh, worship of other deities and done by another Israelite, it has to be eradicated from the Deuteronomic state because it's a threat to the order. If anyone secretly entices you, even if it is your brother, your father's son, or your mother's son, or your own son or daughter, or your, the wife you embrace, or your most intimate friend. So now we're dealing with uh, sedition within the family. Uh, saying, let's go worship other gods whom you have, neither you or your ancestors have known, any of the gods of the people who are around you, whether near or far away, from one end of the earth to the other, it doesn't matter where you imported these deities that you are working, uh, worshiping, uh, you shall uh, not yield or listen to such people. Show them no pity or compassion. Do not shield them, but you shall surely kill them. Your own hand shall be first against them to execute them, and afterwards the hand of the people. Stone them to death. Stoning is the preeminent uh, punishment of a crime against the whole community. It is a punishment by the community of people who threaten its integrity. So that's the rationale. Anytime you see references in these codes to stoning, it's an indication that they consider it to be a threat to the body politic to the religious life of the whole people. Um, so that is to be eradicated. And then at the next level, if you hear about it and about one of your towns who says uh, that the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that scoundrels from among you have gone out and led the inhabitants of the whole town astray, 
saying, let us go worship other gods and so on. So uh, it's going to work out the same way if it's a whole town that does this. Now, obviously, these cases are, on the one hand, uh, uh, contrived in one way or another. Uh, and the way in which it is expressed uh, makes almost a joke out of it. People don't normally go around saying, hey, let's go worship other gods. Uh, it's not uh, in character to do that. So the cases themselves are fabricated, but the point is clear enough. These are all cases which threaten the internal integrity of Israel. And that's what they're trying to uh, uh, get away from. Uh, they don't say, you know, the Assyrians ought not be worshiping the god Asher. That's not their interest. But if you have people in your own midst who are saying, let's go worship the god Asher, then you're in trouble. And it has to be taken with utmost seriousness because it is a threat against the Deuteronomic state. So these are the laws of high treason against the state. Uh, the organization of the rest of the material uh, is somewhat haphazard in some ways. Uh, <coughs> it will talk about uh, for example, the uh, uh, support of different people within the society. Uh, and you get the, uh, an interesting law having to do with what you do with the tithes in the uh, third year. Uh, chapter 14, verse 28, for example. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce, that is a full 10% of your produce, for that year, and store it within your towns. And the Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, that is, the, the Levites are not granted land in the division of the land, according to Deuteronomy, among the tribes. The, the tribe of the Levites is solely to serve the sanctuary, and therefore it does not farm the way everybody else does, and therefore it does not get a land allotment, which raises the question, so how do you support Levites? Well, you support Levites by giving them the tithe that you collect in the third year. That's the way you support a, a hungry Levite. Uh, <clears throat> but you also support the resident aliens, that is, the people who are not native-born Israelites, but who also have to be supported, uh, or your orphans or your widows. Now these, these categories, uh, these four categories, are all people who in most Near Eastern societies would be wards of the state. It would be the king whose job it is to take care of them. But we'll see in a minute that the king in the Deuteronomic state has almost nothing to do and no power to do it in. So it becomes, and this is characteristic of Deuteronomic law, it becomes the responsibility of the people to take care of those who are in need. And so you take care of the widow and the orphan who also are likely not to have property and have to have support from someone. And whereas normally it would be the king who is responsible for this, in the Deuteronomic state it is the entire people and the device that they use for doing this is the tithe which is collected in the third year. So you are beginning to build up a legal system uh, that depends a lot for its enforcement on the people as a whole. It is a, a way of dealing with the fact that the central judicial system that most kings would operate does not operate in the Deuteronomic state. Uh, it's very much a local judicial system, as we'll see when we get there. Uh, and uh, in uh, chapter uh, 16, the beginning of the chapter, uh, we get a list of centralized festivals. This is a result of the uh, centralization of worship in Deuteronomy and it addresses one of those problems caused by this law of centralization. If you have a law of centralization and you have only a central place where the Lord may be worshipped, 
it wipes out the local worship of the deity in towns. And this creates two problems. It creates the problem of what to do with spare clergy <laughs> that used to wander around and, and uh, provide services for sacrifice in the towns, in other words, the Levites. And we'll address that momentarily, what you do with out-of-work Levites. Uh, but also, it creates a problem. Uh, and Deuteronomy will have to take that up. All of the festivals, including the Passover, which was preeminently instituted in Exodus as a home festival. Remember that the, and, and it is that way to this day, of course, uh, primarily a festival in the household. And remember in the Exodus story that it is the homes of people which are marked with the blood of the Passover lamb the, that the angel of death then passes over. So they're practicing a home Passover uh, in that, according to Exodus. Uh, in Deuteronomy, that's to be centralized. You have to go to the central place. And similarly, all of the harvest festivals um, have to be practiced at the local sanctuary. So what do you do with the produce that is still in the fields when you get your first harvest of the grapes or the first harvest of the barley? What do you do? Do you uh, leave the rest of it in the field to rot while you go to the central place? and take uh, you know, the produce to, the, uh, to offer it at the central sanctuary. Uh, Deuteronomy recognizes the problem and says, no, you can send one person. You don't have to send everybody. So uh, they're already trying to address this problem that they have now created by having a central sanctuary. Uh, their lack of a, a judicial system is also a problem. Uh, and so in chapter 16, they make provisions for that. If you're going to have a local judicial system and no essential court of appeals, which would normally, again, traditionally in the Near East be the king to this day in Saudi Arabia, uh, if you don't like the way a local case has been handled, you can make a direct appeal to the king who one day a week hears petitions from individuals in the kingdom. And we'll see when we get to the Davidic uh, stories that David is criticized for operating a bad judicial appeal system. And so that was the practice, but not in Deuteronomy's world. In Deuteronomy's world, all of this is to take place locally. So in chapter 16, uh, verse 18, uh, you shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes in all your towns, so these are local judges. These are not centralized judges. In all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, and they shall render just decisions for the people. Uh, you will notice this characteristic insistence on justice in the judicial system, which is necessary because there is no other way to enforce local justice. If the people themselves cannot do it, then you can't depend on a higher court to institute justice on your behalf. Uh, it has to be done locally, and they know the difficulties with that system, that it's easier on the small scale to pervert justice than it is not. And so you have to render just decision, and you have to be sure that you do it, uh, you must not distort justice. You must not show partiality. You must not accept bribes, for the bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Justice and only justice you shall pursue. These ringing words for, from Deuteronomy about the ensuring of justice, which is necessary because of the local character of justice. There is some irony that these are the words carved over the entrance to the Supreme Court building in Washington. Uh, would that it were true. Uh, justice and only justice you shall pursue so that you may live and occupy the land. Notice again that if you don't do this, you are going to lose the land. This is one of Deuteronomy's insistent laws. You shall not set up a stone pillar, things that the Lord your God hates. Um, it moves on from there to the reason for having to do business that way. 
and that is the law governing kingship. Uh, if there is not a king who is responsible for all this, then just what does the king do? Well, very little. Uh, being king, according to Deuteronomy, is mostly all glory and no uh, income. Uh, this is chapter 17, verse 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set over you a king, but there are some qualifications. It has to be one whom the Lord your God will choose, so the office of king is not inherited from your predecessor. Uh, it has to be chosen directly by the deity. And we'll see this playing out in the narratives about the rise of kingship in Israel later on in uh, Samuel and in Kings. Well, it has to be one whom the Lord your God will choose. One of your own community you may set as king over you. You are not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not from your own community. This would seem to rule out uh, agreements, for example, with the Assyrians or the Egyptians who might claim the right to rule over you. Uh, Deuteronomy will not permit that. It has to be a local Israelite who does this. Uh, even so, if you get somebody like this, he must not acquire many horses for himself or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses since the Lord has said to you, you must never go that way again. What in the world is that all about? Uh, horses are used in this period mostly to uh, pull war chariots. So the prohibition against the king having a lot of horses and making international deals in order to get more horses is a way of saying that the king is not to have a standing army. And this is a major disadvantage uh, to a king. Uh, in antiquity, down to the present day, uh, despotic rulers arise often because they have the support of the local army. They are still able to uh, keep themselves in power because of the way the army operates, not in the Deuteronomic state. The king cannot have a chariot force, which would give him a military advantage. Uh, not only that, he must not acquire many wives for himself. Uh, the exchange of wives is one of the ways in which these international treaties are enforced. It symbolizes the treaty relationship between Israel and the uh, people with whom they have military alliances. This is true throughout uh, the ancient Near East, uh, beginning as far back as we can trace it. And it will be this that, according to the Deuteronomistic history, gets Solomon in such trouble uh, because of his uh, treaties that he has with foreign powers, and he allows uh, the exchange of wives, which Deuteronomy, remember, forbids because they say it, it leads to the worship of other deities, and that, they say, is exactly the trap that Solomon himself fell into. So you must not acquire many wives. He must not acquire many wives. Or else his heart will turn away. Also silver and gold he must not acquire in great quantity. So there's no treasury, apparently, for him to spend. So what in the world does the king do? He has no army. He has no power. He doesn't uh, serve as the chief judge. Uh, he is not a chief lawmaker. So what does the king do? Well, when he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law, that is the book of Deuteronomy, written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests to make sure that everything is there. Uh, and it shall remain with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God diligently observing all the words of this law and this, these statutes, neither exalting himself above other members of the community nor turning aside from the commandment either to the right or to the left so that his descendants may reign long 
in the kingdom of Israel. That's the limited monarchy of Deuteronomy. Now, exactly how this would have worked out in practice uh, is hard to know because the kings very rarely thought this was a good idea. And we'll see uh, later on in the story of the monarchy and its rise and continuation uh, that they do everything they can to try to undercut these sorts of Deuteronomic restrictions on the monarchy. So we're dealing with a very much a uh, state which is lineage based, that is it's based on small group relationships among families and central government does not play a major role. We'll return to that theme later when we look at judges. Uh, when we get back on Monday, I want to say a little about uh, the Levites, the prophets, and most particularly the Holy War, uh, because the next thing we're going to take up is the book of Joshua, which is Deuteronomy's perfect example of a holy war and how a holy war actually works. <laughs>